Yeah, it's fine. You can take your pen if you want to. Okay. Good, good morning. Does anybody mind if I take a picture? If you don't want to put your head down or look away, that's fine. My boss will probably ask how many people showed up to see you speak. Uh, so if, if there's no objections, uh, uh, thank you. Smile if you like. Uh, I'm reasonably informal, so if you have questions throughout, feel free to interrupt. Uh, I think I'm okay on time, so I'm not too worried about going over. So if you have, if you have a question, feel free. Um, this is, come on in, uh, this is hacker versus tools. Uh, I like to call it the use of which, when, where, uh, when you might choose to employ a hacker like myself or when to use tools or services at, at different stages in your SDLC. So why, why, what are we going to talk about today? What's our goals? And ultimately... Uh, this is less of my, my mo not my most hacking talk, I'm doing a couple others today uh, that are more hacker focused. This one's more about building secure software. Uh, so ultimately your goal is to build things that can't be easily hacked. And a company or a developers who consider security throughout their application lifecycle uh, often develop more secure products. Um, so in some areas where can you automate uh, your processes and your controls and your SDLC, or when would you need to use that manual approach, that finesse that a hacker like myself would provide. Uh, so, and then we're also going to consider when there are, when you're building one application or building 300 applications, uh, how, how do I scale or where can you use tools to help yourself scale at a larger area. And ultimately, I want to get you to help Think more like a hacker, so if you're a developer, maybe try and think more like me a little bit, so you can find vulnerabilities in your code earlier as you're developing, and then hopefully it's the ultimate goal is to build secure software, like I said. So who am I? Uh, Jeff, hi. Uh, I'm a security engineer at Security Innovation. We do application security and pen testing uh, out of the States, but pretty much all over. I work out of Toronto, so I came all the way from my basement to be here today with you today. Occasionally they let me out, uh, and occasionally I put on pants. Uh, previous to that, I was a high school teacher. Uh, I've taught in prisons and universities, all very uh, interesting experiences, and I hope you guys will be as captive of an audience as some of my previous students. Uh, yeah. So let's get started. So. A bit of a disclaimer about this. I mean, we're having, we're going to have a casual debate about hackers versus tools. And for me, I consider myself completely vendor agnostic, says the guy with branded slides. But uh, when it comes to solving my problem or hacking something, I'll use whatever gets me through the door. And uh, I don't really care if it, if it takes a scanner, if I have to learn a whole new language and write a script in that language to to exploit it, that's what I'll do. Uh, so it really doesn't matter to me. So um, just when we're having this debate, I'm talking about where you would use particular tools. I'm not trying to sell you any particular tools. Uh, I do provide services in all areas of the SDLC, so uh, all different areas of advisory. So, And I am a hacker. As a result of that, I'm probably a little biased towards the hacker or using a tool or automation. Um, but there's benefits to both, and we're going to examine those. So I've used the word hacker a few times already without accurately defining it. Uh, we can debate definitions as much as you like. For the sake of this presentation, I like to think about it more in terms of the hacker mindset and thinking about complex or creative ways to solve pro complex problems. So when we talk about the qualities of a hacker, they are going to invest research and energy into deeply understanding a problem, and they may make use of tools to solve their problems or to exploit or whatever challenge they're trying to overcome. Now that's contrary mostly to what uh, media representation of what my job is or any uh, TV shows that use hacking to quickly wrap their plot and solve all their problems all at once in a nice 30 minute episode. Uh, really, for anybody not in the offensive field, it, it does take a lot of work. And usually the end result of my work is 
a quick little script or action that automatically exploits a system, but it's a lot of energy and time in advance into the research of that. And when we think about a security tool, uh, where they're going to have strengths and benefits is going to be around solving problems quickly and automating some of the main mundane tasks of finding vulnerabilities or issues. And it has the advantage of using things like signatures, and behaviors, and analytics. And uh, it's good when you have 300 applications to test. Right? It would take me a while to test 300 applications. And uh, oh, I'm back. so I don't really care what SDLC model you're using, uh, whether you're a uh, traditional waterfall or life cycle, or whether you're more agile or you're some kind of hybrid. Uh, we'll start with uh, this more traditional model today, and then we'll move in and talk about exceptions for a more agile environment. Uh, so throughout your development process, while you're building software, you have various opportunities to implement security controls. And often, uh, so at various points, you may want to use a hacker, or you might choose to use a tool. And there's benefits and disadvantages to both. So hackers are great thinking about problems from a different perspective. I'm really great at finding edge cases, things you, that you might not have thought about. And uh, the tools are going to be more thorough. And at finding, well, I'm not saying I'm not thorough, but uh, when you get to large applications, there's a limit to the amount of things that I can find in a given time frame. And uh, tools can be really good at finding known issues, things that every mi mistake that developers make, whether that's cross-site scripting, SQL injection, uh, any sort of coding bad practices, tools can find those pretty easily. So here what we're going to do today is we're going to look at each of these phases of the SDLC, and uh, we'll look at where the pros and cons and where you would use a hacker and a tool. So sort of the we're going to do. So we'll start with the security requirements. And the big question you have when you're dealing with security requirements is, have I thought of everything? So as early as possible, you want to make sure that you're considering every possible security implication of the features you're about to build or the product you're about to build, which is a challenge. It's, it's uh, definitely how do you foresee all of the problems you might have with security? And, uh, but certainly, the more things you find in this phase, the better off you are. It is uh, a lot cheaper and easier and faster to fix security issues in the requirements phase than in production. And depending on what vendor you ask or who's issued the most recent report, that can be 30 to 100 times more expensive uh, versus finding it in, in the requirements phase versus, the, versus production. It really depends who you ask. Those, those numbers get crazy wild and ex expensive. Which is true, though, because if I find, let's say, an authorization-related issue that might affect your entire application, that could require you to completely redesign the application, which could cost you a lot of time and money uh, to fix it. So it's better to think of these things earlier. So if you're thinking about a hacker versus different tools that are available, uh, a hacker will probably find things you haven't thought of. So if I were to sit down with you and review your requirements, I'm probably going to think of dozens of things that uh, you, might not, you might have missed. Uh, I'm really good at coming up with edge cases and really obscure examples of ways that I might exploit your application. That's, that's something I like doing. It's, that's uh, where I get the excitement of my job. Um, then again, I might not think of everything. It's, it's how do you know, unless you're putting uh, multiple people on a problem, it's going to take a lot to make sure that uh, you've thought of every possible scenario or outcome. And you may not even realize it until down the road. So for some of the basic things, you might consider on the tool side, simple things like checklists. And knowing that uh, all data at rest needs to be encrypted, or all data in transit needs to be uh, using proper secure channels, uh, having filters and uh, input validation on any of your data as it comes in. So those are simple things you could put into a checklist to make sure that for every application you're doing, you're making sure that you're meeting at least some of the security requirements or as many of them as possible are considered early on. Uh, 
Threat modeling, some people pucker up uh, a little tighter when they hear that one. Uh, it doesn't have to be a tedious and uh, challenging task, but it can help uh, focus your security requirements to ensure that you're compensating for the most critical things. If you consider the assets you most wish to protect, well, then you can develop threat models around those and put mitigating defenses in place, as well as other uh, system processes uh, in terms of making sure that people actually follow the checklist or making sure that there is a review process for requirements. Those would be other tools or systems you could put in place to improve that. Moving on. When we consider your design architecture, um, when everybody does this a little differently, and I wouldn't say there's a global solution for this, but uh, it's either around use cases or user stories. Sometimes I'll see data flow diagrams or architecture diagrams and uh, server stack layouts, uh, stuff like that. That's what I'll see if I'm doing an architecture review. Uh, and when we look at what tools are available for that, really there's threat modeling again, and there's really not a lot of tools to help you automate if you're building 300 applications and they have all different architectures. There isn't a ton of tools available to help you do that and make sure that you're catching everything or not finding issues. As a hacker, this is probably my favorite area of the SDLC to uh, perform pen tests on or to engage and help advise on. And the reason is I usually just sit into it, put me in a room with the developer or the designers of an application and a diagram and let me ask as many questions as I want. And I'll just keep asking questions until I identify something that they haven't thought of yet. And that's really a, uh, something I enjoy doing. And usually, if I can do it in a Socratic way, I get them thinking about their application more, and they tell me the areas that they haven't thought of. And then that becomes a conversation that we have to, to, make, to redesign the application in a secure way. Again, but this, the problem with this is it doesn't scale well, and you have challenges when you have a number of applications you're developing, I can't meet with every member on your team. If you have a development team of a thousand people and you're, they're all developing different products, I can't meet with all of them, right? So uh, there is, if you were going to invest and build a, an idea, try and solve this problem and uh, there might be a market for you. When you come to actually building the code, there's actually some reasonable solutions out already. Uh, there are different uh, plugins that you can put into your IDE to remind you to implement secure code uh, and different frameworks you could use. Uh, there's lots of static analysis tools. Uh, a lot of product vendors love selling those to you and implementing them. Uh, they're good at finding some vulnerabilities and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the challenge with those tools is there can be a lot of false positives. And if you've ever had to audit a scan result report, uh, you could be inundated with thousands of vulnerabilities that you need to address. And which ones do you triage first? And which ones are not of concern to you at all because the scanner has thrown a false positive? But the strength of if you've got 40 or 50,000 lines of code, it's going to take me a while to read that. So... Uh, it's good for covering uh, large tools. Another thing, sometimes people de develop them and uh, they sit in a file or on a shelf somewhere essentially, is secure coding guidelines, whoever's read them or had to produce them. I think I've produced uh, dozens for different companies at, over the course of my career. Uh, whether or not they're actually used, I don't know. It's going to take a process in place to enforce that. Uh, as a hacker, I do a lot of training engagements where I can help. Uh, developers think more like me, so encourage your invest in training for your developers would be an area to uh, improve this. Um, and I can find a lot of complex vulnerabilities that scanners have a challenge with. Uh, at the development side, they're doing static analysis and they're looking for memory issues, input validation issues, randomization, some session management stuff, but the I think I'm spoiling the next slide, actually, so I'll, I'll, I'll switch to that one first. Uh, so what can, static what can you find with static analysis? So it's really good at finding what's called source to sync issues. 
things like cross-site scripting where data comes in, where does data go out. Uh, it's really good at finding that and that's a reasonably critical vulnerability. So it's, it's worth having if it can find that vulnerability early, early enough on. Uh, it's decent at finding security misconfigurations, things like uh, insecure randomness or uh, some session management issues. If you're using outdated libraries, it'll identify you. Uh, but it is going to throw a lot of false positives. Uh, it's not good at finding things like authorization issues, uh, some authentication issues like password resets or brute force passwords. It won't tell you that the page you created is vulnerable to a weak password reset. It, it just doesn't have the capabilities for that. Uh, it won't consider your business rules at all. Uh, and it will find some memory corruption issues depending on the tool you're using. Some are better than others. And it won't find de uh, design flaws. So static an analysis tools have a purpose. You need, anytime you're going to use any tool, you need to know what the purpose of that tool is, what it can do, and what it can't do. So if you're using a static analysis tool, there are strengths, and, uh, but you need to be aware of what it can't do so that you can then compensate that with a manual process or other mitigating controls. Um, When you get to the testing phase, my, uh, ideally, you'd like to have found these earlier, but this is really your first chance to find, uh, do perform static or sorry, dynamic analysis on the application, so in runtime. So if you find it at this point, it could require additional redesign or architecture changes. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, what can they do, what's good, bad, what the hacker can do, what the tools can do. You can consider the whole picture of the application at this point because you can now see everything and you can you could view the code as well as potentially and you could uh, see how it behaves. So a hacker can really see the whole picture of the application, how, how it behaves, uh, what the business rules are in place. You're usually limited by best time and effort uh, if con combined with source code. Uh, can give best perspective in defining vulnerabilities. So I like to use both. I'd like to, ha where possible, I'd love to have the source code while doing runtime analysis. Uh, and if the application is very large, it can be a challenge to cover all pages or parameters of an application. What the tool is capable of is fuzzing high volume cases, crawling large applications, authenticated versus unauthenticated, unauthenticated testing. Sometimes some of the, the larger tool suites will do that. Um, and it still has trouble with business logic. In production, similar things as QA testing, uh, but I, now a hacker can leverage external resources. So things like uh, social engineering, social media, uh, Google reconnaissance. I can, level, I can leverage vulnerable users, phishing attacks. And I can, uh, if you're a motivated attacker and you wanted to find a vulnerability on a system to exploit and you had six months to invest, you could invest six months on it. If, if, that, if your motivation was there. And mainly the tools you'll see in this space are uh, signature-based or heuristic-based threat intelligence, uh, abno abnormality detect detection, and you're merely you're watching what's coming over the wire on your network. Uh, and then you could do continuous scanning. So some people scan their applications every month, every quarter, to ensure that their new vulnerabilities haven't been introduced. Uh, just on Time will speed up a bit, but I just want to consider agile. Really, if you're thinking about, if you're in an agile development, there's three things you want to be considering. Uh, every feature or story requirement, and um, things you're doing, so things you're doing at every new feature you're trying to push, uh, or every uh, story. Things you're doing with every sprint or time frame, whether that sprint is two weeks or two months, uh, it's depending on your environment. And then things you're going to do for regular maintenance or paying down your technical debt. So we'll look at those three categories of things you should be doing throughout. And I don't, I'm not really breaking this one down as hacker versus tool as much, uh, just sort of looking at it uh, from an overall perspective. So, with every new feature that you're going to introduce or every new user story, depending on your agile environment, you want to consider the following. Does the new feature consider the implications 
does the feature requirements consider the implications of the overall project? All right, so introducing this new feature, does it affect my requirements and does it affect my security requirements? So have I considered all those things from the checklist earlier on? Am I still considering those with every new feature? And then how will this new feature affect the overall threat model or uh, application security posture? So just those two things you need to consider with every new feature. And then when you get into every sprint or new release, uh, you need to ensure that, again, those requirements, those security requirements, continue to apply across your, across your system. So whether it's an every deployment checklist that you're running through to make sure that nothing has regressed in terms of the code base, uh, ensuring that your threat model doesn't change. If you're going to introduce new features, new assets, well, that's going to affect your threat model. Uh, you got to consider the impact on the architecture as well. And you may consider, or I would recommend, obviously, uh, automated code review, manual peer review, of your applications, and then security testing of, at the very least, that new feature. So um, I see a lot of banking apps where they'll introduce a new banking feature, and they'll tell us to test that particular feature, uh, and we'll do that every couple months for them. And then with regular maintenance, these are, if you don't do this, you're going to be, everyone knows that when you ship software, you encourage, yeah, that's, you know, sending out a liability into the world of something you have to maintain. So if you don't do this regular maintenance, what's the term of your technical debt is going to increase, and eventually it'll, it'll eat at you. So I would recommend that periodic security testing be performed and scanning to ensure that no new issues arise. Whether that's, so let's say your sprint cycle is every two weeks or every month, you, maybe you're doing a penetration test or some sort of security testing every quarter to see that uh, there hasn't been any new changes or introductions into the system, new vulnerabilities introduced. You need to be continuously training your, your team members to look for security vulnerabilities. The, the more you invest in them, the more able they're going to be to think like a hacker to uh, not introduce those vulnerabilities in the first place. And they're going to help the best, they're going to be the best resource to help finding the, the, the vulnerabilities. Uh, and then you're going to need to take a big picture at your, res at your results. So from any vulnerabilities that are introduced or found, are there any ways you can improve your processes for your next sprint or your next cycle uh, based on issues that have been found? So if you're finding that the scanners are always finding cross-site scripting, well, maybe you could introduce additional training on cross-site scripting for your developers, or maybe you could put a p system in place so that uh, that doesn't get introduced into your application. Right? So that's sort of just paying down your technical debt. So the secrets, it's really, it takes the whole team thinking about security in an agile, you know, I could argue that it takes this in all environments, but particularly in agile, it takes a lot more uh, cooperation amongst team members for security. And you need to be performing regular checks to ensure that uh, no additional new feature, no vulnerabilities are introduced. And continuously improving on your uh, processes in order to improve the security posture and security controls throughout the system. So if we were to say hacker versus tool, uh, who wins, who loses, uh, I'd argue that an informed hacker will know when to use which and when to rely on their instinct. So when to use a tool or when to use their instinct. And I would encourage all of you to think more about uh, think more like a hacker to help make your tools better as well as your applications more secure. Uh, there is, in the notion of hacking, if I was to teach you or advise you on how to be a hacker today, uh, my lesson would be to learn the, the tool, or sorry, learn the trade, not the tool, uh, to prevent you from becoming a script kitty, right? That would be, um, so you really want to take the time and energy to understand the application and environment you're working on and to then think of ways that you could exploit the system. Uh, that's pretty much all for me today. Selfless plug for the two other talks I'm doing today. Uh, this talk was really geared towards developers on building secure software and thinking like a hacker. Uh, later today, 
At 12.30 uh, next door, I'm doing security best practices for users, where I, if you consider your personal privacy and security, you can stop by that one if you like. And then uh, this afternoon, I'm doing catching IMSI catchers, which is some work I did finding rogue cellular towers. Uh, that's upstairs on the 11th floor, so if you haven't seen the 11th floor yet, uh, it's quite a spectacular view from up there, and uh, I'd encourage you to, to come by. Um, thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Thank you very much to Jeffrey Wogan. Here is a certificate for you for, for doing this great presentation. Great, great start here. Uh, so do we have any questions? We do have, we do have some time for questions here. Okay, so I'll start off then. Okay. Um, so all these steps of software development life cycle, they are, they are quite different, you know, starting from the planning phase to, 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 to finishing with the execu execution phase. Uh, would you say teamwork is required on hacker side to do that, or, or is it possible to do it, do it alone? Yeah, so the more I can be involved with the team as more of a strategic advisor than just a, a, a full red team hacker, uh, the more I can usually find, and the more I, I can help. So I would say that uh, there's the notion of red teaming versus blue teaming, uh, which is attack versus defense, but there's a pretty strong argument for what's called, what we're calling purple teaming, where you're engaged with the developers to help them build the most secure product. If you just wait to engage me in, in the QA phase and I find something, that's going to introduce delays and it's going to cost you more time and money to fix those issues, whereas if you can engage me earlier on, I can hopefully guide you through that full process. 